thanks for that introduction, Claire, and thanks for inviting me here. If you're going to do talks, what a wonderful place to do them. Uh, this is the Do Lectures, so I will start by saying my personal feelings about what makes somebody uh, a doer or a non-doer. I think there's a lot of things come into that mix. There's the physical, do we have money, do we have time, opportunity perhaps. And then of course there's how you feel, yourself. Do you have confidence? Do you feel as if you've got the skill set? And also do you have the motivation? But perhaps more importantly on a personal level, it's do you have the self-belief um, and also perhaps the courage that you're willing to fail. So actually, I might not be good enough, but what the hell, I'll have a go at it anyway and just see where it takes me. And when I started out in my life uh, before the polar expeditions, I think all of those things stopped me doing a lot of things in life. I never had the confidence. I didn't think I had the skill set, certainly didn't have the money. And it's been a journey through, throughout my life, and I'm a little bit older now, and I've learned that actually you could maybe find the money, whether it's sponsorship or you can, can make the opportunity, and if you haven't got the skill set, there are people out there that you can learn it from or just have a go. And uh, so I'd like to talk to you just quickly about how I got involved in the world of polar exploration. Uh, doing at 40 below. I actually have done at 70 below, and that's uh, pretty tricky. But I started out life uh, not a natural polar explorer. I was brought up in the centre of Bradford, had no outdoor experience whatsoever, never had a rucksack on my back. Uh, I left school at 15 uh, and then got a job in a bank. And then I had problems at having children, so I went down the IVF route and was so lucky to have triplets. And they were my catalyst in starting to believe in myself. Because if I can bring triplets up uh, without outside help, <laughs> trust me, I can do anything. <laughs> So how did all the madness start, though? It was a pure chance. It was an advert. And actually, uh, it's something that I would have to thank my ex-husband for. He saw it. And it was asking for ordinary women to apply to go to the North Pole for the first time. I now think he probably had some reason to get encouraged <laughs> me. <laughs> but he did. <laughs> and my first reaction was, not me. You know, not me. I, I've got 18-month-old triplets. I, I don't know anything about the North Pole. I've never seen the outdoors. And he said, well, it says ordinary people. So I sent an application form off. Um, it's in the paper. It's £75, which we had to scrape together to get. And I thought, well, that's me now. I'm going to be on crime watch with all the rest of the gullible housewives that have sent their money off to a fictitious address. <laughs> Uh, well, that didn't happen. I got a kit list and I was told to turn up on Dartmoor. And that was my first biggest challenge. I didn't own a pair of walking boots, let alone anything on this kit list. But I lived in a military town, so I borrowed everything that I owned. And when I turned up on Dartmoor, I looked fantastic. I looked like G.I. Jane. I knew nothing. <laughs> So uh, Dartmoor on England uh, is a very boggy, uh, it's a huge, well it is for us, it's obviously not for you, uh, it's a huge common ground uh, and it's very rough. And when I turned up there was over 250 women had applied for this uh, expedition and we turned up and they were all outward bound instructors, mountaineers, they'd all been to the far corners of the world and I was the only one who had no experience. I didn't know what I was doing. And so I just tucked in behind somebody uh, and followed them. There was a camera crew, so they kept asking for volunteers to swim in cold rivers. And I thought, well, I don't know what I'd do, so I was just volunteering for everything. Yes, I'll do it if it's cold and horrible. Choose me. <laughs> By the end of the day, I was in so much pain. It was dark and raining. I just sobbed and thought, get me home. What? am I doing here? 
But then the media turned up and the newspapers and mother of triplets, Anne Daniels, was interviewed a lot for this sort of the quirky factor. And they asked me lots of questions about what will it be like when you get to the North Pole? And at first I'm thinking, don't be ridiculous, I just want to go home. And then I just, I caught the dream and thought, hang on a minute, this is my chance to change my life. What will it be like to go to the North Pole? And I thought, well, I've got two choices. I either walk away now because I was that bad, or I grasp it and I try and I, I really embrace the challenge. Thankfully for me, they didn't choose the team. They sent us away for nine months and said, all come back, whoever wants to, and then we'll choose the team. So I had nine months, three small children, no nannies, and so my life became more hell. I would take them to the gym in the morning and train downstairs uh, in the gym. In the afternoon when they slept, I'd be on the patio with an old rowing machine or doing circuits. Friends taught me how to read a map. Even taking the children for a walk became running down the roads with three of them. It was madness. But bit by bit, I got strong and fit and I began to learn the skills of, of outdoor life. So when I went back down in nine months' time, I could now do the things that they were asking. Uh, and I got chosen. That was my biggest, I think, the biggest thing I have ever achieved in a little barn in a muddy field in Dartmoor to have been picked to go on the team. So we went to uh, the Arctic. And if the Dartmoor was uh, something wild for me, the Arctic <laughs> blew my mind. It is just, the Arctic particularly, it's a moving ocean. There's nothing around you, nothing man-made, and it's like a living beast of its own. And I found I was good at expedition life. We went to the North Pole in relay. So I was on the first leg, and then we came out, and the next leg came in. And then on the 27th of May, 1997, we got there. Uh, I didn't step on the pole, but it was a wonderful achievement when I saw on the TV that the last team had got there. Uh, but from that, I wanted to do my own expedition. So four of the team got together and we walked the whole way to the South Pole, and that was a British team. But I think the expedition that I really want to talk to you about today is the big uh, North Pole in 2002. I had that dream, I'd done the first bit, I'd done the last little bit, uh, the last degree, doing some uh, work with some people that wanted to go to the North Pole. I'd never done a whole journey. So I asked uh, Pom Oliver at the front here and Caroline Hamilton if they would join me. Uh, they were all on the relay and the South Pole team. Uh, Caroline actually was the one that put it together uh, and led uh, the original expedition. At uh, first they said, no, Anne, no, <laughs> it's madness. There's a reason this journey hasn't been done uh, by a female team. Uh, it just is impossible. And after a while, I convinced them, uh, and they agreed to join me. We then had to raise an enormous amount of money, which again was a bit of a stumbling block. But eventually, M&G came on board, and they supported us. So that was it. I'd done the first leg of the original. I thought I knew what we were going to uh, encounter and what was going to happen. I actually couldn't have been uh, further from the truth. To go to the North Pole, is in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. You can either go from Russia or Canada. If you go really, Alaska's just miles away, why would you go so far? Uh, if you leave from Greenland, you'll get on the currents and you just can't walk fast enough to get there. Uh, so it is, it's the geographical North Pole, not the magnetic, and you have to walk uh, over from Canada 500 miles of snow, ice, and moving crust of ocean. When we set off, I expected temperatures to be about minus 30. They were actually, for the first 27 days, between minus 58 and minus 42. It was unbelievably cold. <laughs> if you think your fridges, your freezers, uh, the average domestic freezer is minus 18. Do you think of what's happening to all that food in the freezer? Uh, when you're walking in, in the minus 40s and minus 50s, you're fighting against all this cold and freezing everything, your fingers, your face, uh, and everything froze. 
And I guess we expected that to a certain extent, but what we really didn't expect was our brains froze. So we couldn't think clearly. Thought processes just weren't happening and everything slows down to a really minute detail. We'd carry one bag and stagger to the sledge and, and drop it in. It was almost as if we were permanently drunk and, and permanently cold. And if it was bad enough outside, we, we, when we got in the tent, that is a portrait from here in the tent. We lit the cookers and the tent just filled with steam. So we're at minus 40, so we'd sit on our sleeping bags, we couldn't see each other. Uh, life was <laughs> pretty foul. All we had uh, during the day uh, to cook and to drink with was we had two stoves and on that we would uh, do all our cooking and drinking. We didn't have any personal possessions, we had a diary and a pencil because everything you, you are carrying everything you need. So you don't carry anything that you're not going to drink or you're not going to use for survival or to get you to your destination. So it really was life at its bare minimum. And with that, there is also a lot of beauty and, and you do become one with this nature that's about to kill you. <laughs> Trying. <laughs> uh, we worked as a team a lot, uh, pulling the sledges over ridges. It would take three of us to get the sledges over each ridge. And on one occasion, we had a situation only on day six where all the ice began to break around us. Um, and we ended up in a situation we were uh, sort of skiing uh, along uh, and everything began to crack, everything began to break. Uh, and we suddenly found that well, we better get the tent up, we better try and uh, sort of get out the area and then get the tent up. Uh, so we skied off out of the area, there's winds blowing, uh, and as we tried to put the tent up, the wind came to such an extent that it picked the tent, which we should clip onto Pom, and slammed her against the nearest pressure ridge, damaging all her shoulder, so we knew we wouldn't get the tent up. Uh, we lay it on the floor, climbed under it, and just lay there for three days while the wind battered us to death. Uh, I had to get out during that three days to set off an emergency beacon to say that we were okay. Uh, and I do remember that was the most terrifying bit of the trip as every bit of me just went cold and I thought that was the time that maybe I was facing my mortality. Thankfully, all bad things do change. Uh, the sun came out. So what do you do? You're so far behind schedule as we were. <laughs> it's a perfect travelling day. Well, we just took the day off and just put the tent up. It was time to reflect, to ask what we were doing out here and to just group together again. Uh, and we sat, we designed the colours, being girls, <laughs> and we sat there and just became friends again and, and motivated each other. But as we moved on, we were physically, uh, there were problems physically uh, to us and we were great as a team. In our heads we were strong, but actually Pom had really bad frost damage and Caroline had quite bad frost damage fingers. Uh, they're obviously getting better. We didn't take pictures of them when they were at their worst. Uh, and they were that bad, she couldn't do anything for herself. She couldn't dress herself, she couldn't take herself to the toilet. Unfortunately, that's the only time I probably uh, wished I didn't perhaps have three children as soon as it came to me. But you know that you are a team when you're willing to wipe each other's bottoms. What she didn't do, I would say here, what she also didn't do is she didn't whinge and complain about what she couldn't do. She thought about what she could do and she could pull a sledge. And so we dress her, wipe her bottom, strap her to a sledge and, and off she went and we pushed the sledge from behind. And I think that to me showed great courage and strength in Caroline that she, she was always positive. Pom. Uh, had problems with her feet. So a lot of the terrain, when I say walk to the North Pole, it's pretty horrendous terrain. And she kept going and her feet, she got wet gangrene in and it got worse and worse. As we sort of went on, we talked a lot about, about what would happen because it became really obvious to us that Pom was in a really bad state. 
each night we would dress her toes. Um, but she was the heroine of this trip. For 47 days, she had a uh, frostbite and she kept going to keep the expedition alive. Just in case you were in any doubt as to how brave she was. Unfortunately, we had a resupply and Pom made the decision that she sacrificed her, her dream for the expedition. And I thought that was the bravest thing I've ever seen because if she'd have stayed, we would not have been able to do the things to get to the pole. I think my biggest challenge was not jumping on that plane and <laughs> out of there with her. So it left Caroline and I 300 miles in less than 30 days. And at first we panicked but then we just sat down and found new motivation and we'll do it not just for the sponsors, the family, we'll, we'll do it for POM. As she left, the ice began to melt, so we had new problems, thin ice, you can't walk on the thin ice, and we were always going around. So when I say 500 miles to the pole, I think we did closer to seven or 800. But with difficulties become new possibilities. Sometimes we'd use an island to cross the open water. Sometimes, uh, with open water, you do get bears. <laughs> that was also a challenge. Uh, we luckily didn't find any on that way. But sometimes we would swim. We had Mr. Orange and we'd put Mr. Orange on. And at first we were scared of Mr. Orange and swimming. In those days, people didn't swim to get to the North Pole. Uh, and at first we tested it on thin ice and sometimes we'd go through, but it meant we could walk on things that we wouldn't walk on before. And as we got more confident, the thing that we were afraid of most helped us. So we just got in the water. And, and as we got better, we used it as a raft as we ate through the sledges and they became lighter. And everything became about how do we do it? How do we get to the pole? Sometimes we'd use the sledges as bridges. Days became long. In the end, we were sleeping five hours and just driving throughout the day um, because we were focused on all these people that were relying on us. We really had to get there. And I don't think it was until the second, uh, the second to last day before we got there that we ever really believed that we would. We just kept doing. It was too big a goal. There was too much going on. And... Uh, even the day, that's the day before the day that we got to the pole, we came across a huge area of open water. That is the picture, although it doesn't look as big. It was about a kilometre along, but we couldn't swim across that. That would be risky. So we just went east the whole day, no northward journey. So in the end, we had to just sacrifice uh, sleep and we were drinking tepid water in order to give us a chance. It wasn't until the last hour we came up over the last ridge that we kind of looked at each other and went, we're going to do this. So we got the British flag out. Like you Americans, we like to plant our flags. <laughs> it's the important part. <laughs> Attached it to us and, and went over the last ridge. To navigate to the North Pole, you use the sun and your watches mainly. It's the easiest and quickest way or, or a small compass if the sun isn't out. But to actually locate the geographical North Pole, it's a fixed point and you're moving. You don't feel as if you're moving. So we had to get a GPS out and we were trying to chuck it down and we went over the last ridge and there was water everywhere. That's an aerial picture. There was so much. And we just thought at this last hurdle, you can't swim and get it. The planes are on their way. We've got an hour to get there. We're going to fail. Eventually we went round and we went down to one of the islands and we're both scurrying around. And then eventually, eventually, bang, we hit it. And there's nothing else there. There's nothing to show you. There's not a pole. There's not a, yay, we're here. Just us. But we felt that is our North Pole. No other person ever will stand on that piece of ice in that place ever again. So it was all in our minds and our, and our hearts. So we did sing the national anthem. <laughs> uh, had a drink of whiskey, which hurt a lot <laughs> in that cold environment. And it always, we did hit the national papers and it always said, and Daniels and Paul Oliver, the first women to walk to the North Pole and the South Pole. And whilst that was great, it saddened me a little because whilst Paul wasn't there, Physically, in spirit, it had been her sacrifices that helped to get us there. So for me, it's Paul Oliver and Daniels and Caroline Hamilton that were the first women in the world. 
since then, I think that I fell in love with the Arctic Ocean. I feel a lot of passion for it. It is nature and it brought me close to nature in a way that I had never been before. So I've been lucky, I'll just quickly, to now work with uh, the Catlin Arctic Survey. It's Penn Haddo's brainchild. Martin, Haddo was a part, Martin Hartley was the photographer. And Penn, uh, women uh, do, it is a man's world. And Penn, I have a lot of respect for. He said, Anne, I want you to lead my ice team and lead me. Even he was the leader on the ice for the expedition, which I thought was, was a great innovative thing for him to do. So what that expedition was about, it was patroned by Prince Charles, was to try and help the Arctic Ocean. And so it was a scientific expedition to measure the thickness of the North Pole ice cap. We wanted to, to photograph it and log it. Because what's the point in finding out about these things if you don't share them with the world and then help other people change their habits? Uh, I led the group. And in the end, of <laughs> none of the radars, £100,000 worth of equipment worked. And at first we panicked, but what we had to do in the end up was go back to the old manual way and we drilled our way across the ocean. Sometimes it was difficult and sometimes it was tricky. The old frostbite brought itself up again. Uh, and Penn, on a night when we'd finished our long days, we'd just drill and manually collect this information. What I did notice about the Arctic Ocean, and I have since 97, is it's becoming flatter, there's less ice, there's more water, and it has dramatically changed. Um, there are still some, it's still a very difficult environment, and it's quite easy to sort of realise that it's not, that, that there's still a lot of ice there, but for what there was, it's a whole new arena. We, uh, people often say, oh, you're all right, you've got air support. Uh, we got stuck for 12 days at the end waiting. And whilst we were a great team, there's certain things nobody must... When you've only got a little bit of food, we were rigid as to how much food each person had and nobody could have a gram more than another. It wasn't just handed out. Uh, and so we got to measuring our food and 10 grams a day. But eventually they came in. David Shipman from the BBC, and it did go out to the world to hopefully just explain what we were doing. We've done it for three years. The year after, it was with Martin uh, and Charlie. And then this year that I've just got back, it, with, uh, it was a multinational expedition uh, with Tyler Fish, who's an American, and myself. We both co-led it, uh, and we had an Australian and a filmmaker. So that's my journey today. Um, I'm just to finish off its doing. I hopefully now try and do, and I just want to quickly, it'll do it itself, let you know my new project, my last Arctic project. I'm getting too old to do this now. Uh, those are the scientists that I have worked with, but this is my new project. That is pictures of all me, so I've obviously done it before. <laughs> but this one is the solo. No woman has ever gone solo to the North Pole from land. So that's my biggest project to date. That's what I want to do in 2012. And that's what I've been running around trying to garner the sponsorship for before I came here. So apologies for not being here uh, earlier. I would have loved to. Uh, and thank you uh, for being such a great audience and listening. <laughs>